Hi everyone, welcome to Miss Adams Teaches Macbeth, Act 3, Scene 6. Okay, so starting off with a little plot summary, this is a, a short scene that is just one conversation taking place between Lennox and an unnamed Lord. So it will remind you perhaps of Act 2, Scene 4, where Ross spoke to an old man about the state of, state of affairs in Scotland. The same thing is happening here, but with a much more kind of critical tone. So the first thing that they have a conversation about is all of the strange occurrences that have happened. He, Lennox reminds us of all of the murders and disappearances and accusations and although he phrases everything quite carefully so as not to directly implicate Macbeth it's quite clear from his tone that he is sitting it well and truly in uh, as Macbeth's responsibility. After they've gone through that catalogue of crimes uh, the unnamed Lord talks about how uh, Malcolm is already in England which we knew we knew that Donald Bain was going to Ireland and Malcolm was going to England but very importantly, he says that Macduff has also left to go and join forces um, with Malcolm and the King of England um, to raise an army. So we knew that Macduff wasn't supporting Macbeth, and now we know that he's actually gone and joined Malcolm, the King of England, Edward um, and Seward, and they are, um, as I said, bringing together this army to uh, fight against Scotland. Now, I won't lie to you, this scene is one of the scenes that it feels like a sort of function scene, but that doesn't mean that it wouldn't come up in an exam. And I know that if this scene came up, I, I feel that people might panic a little bit because it's not one of those like big scenes, you know, like act one, scene five with Lady Macbeth or act two, scene two with the murder. It, it feels quite frightening. So. I want to just give you some advice about not panicking and just breathing deeply and remembering that even though there will be some words and phrases that you might not understand, there will be plenty that you can. And that's what you need to focus on. So you can read through my advice, but the most important thing that you do is when you get that extract in front of you, imagining that it's Act 3, Scene 6, which is a tricky one, that you just read, read, read again until you are absolutely certain you know what the gist is, what the tone is. Now, once you've figured out what's going on in the scene, then you think to yourself, well, how is Shakespeare getting this across? There's no point in just trying to feature spot if you don't know what the meaning is. So meaning first, techniques later and if you struggle with identifying devices go with your easy wins you know look out for punctuation oh it's an exclamation mark it's an exclamative that's a structural comment um if you see a rhyming couplet that's a form um if you can't find any language devices well just talk about word choices everyone can find something emotive um so emotive language and then you can use word class terminology like adjectives nouns verbs okay so there's always something you can do so panic not now we're going to imagine that this extract or sorry this scene because this scene is short enough to be an extract really we're going to imagine a world where an examiner said explore how shakespeare presents macbeth's rule in this scene so it's basically saying how do these guys um present macbeth's type of leadership their experience of him being king OK, so have that in your head as we go through it, although the rest of this scene will take you through the meaning of it in general. OK, so it doesn't have to be for this essay question, but it's a kind of possibility. So let's look at how it opens. Uh, tongue in cheek is Lennox a bit of a gossip. I'm sure he's not. But I think it's important that the scene opens with him saying, my former speeches have but hit your thoughts, which can interpret further. Only I say things have been strangely born. So most important is that, you know, these guys have had this conversation before. The fact that Lennox says my former speeches. So he's saying what I said to you previously has obviously had a really big impact. Um, and then he reiterates things have been strangely born. But note the ambiguity in this vague language, things and strangely born. So Lennox is being 
a little bit careful. Perhaps it's because he doesn't want to be overheard. He doesn't want to get accused of treason, for crying out loud, uh, which he would be because it's going against the king. So he's a little bit more guarded. And we'll see that more in the next bit as well. OK, so vital to this part of the scene is Lennox's tone. So as the piece begins, he seems to just be talking through everything that's happened so far. He says the greatest Duncan was pitied of Macbeth. So Macbeth was upset for Duncan. Marry, he was dead. And the right valiant, notice these adjectives, that gives us a, an indication of how he feels about Banquo, walk too late. Whom you may say, if it please you, Fleance killed, for Fleance fled. Men must not walk too late. So here we have this little indication here, particularly this bit, you may say, if it please you. So the suggestion is, is that there's another interpretation that may not be pleasing to the ear, but is there that, of course, it wasn't Fleance that killed Banquo. It was someone else. And then you've got the sort of slightly sarcastic warning. Men must not walk too late. You know, in Macbeth's rule, men who walk too late could end up dead. Um, but then when you look at the way he describes Macbeth, um, in his reactions to Duncan's death. So who cannot want the thought how monstrous it was for Malcolm and Donalbain to kill their gracious father? Damned fact, how it did grieve Macbeth. Did he not straight in pious rage the two delinquents tear that were the, the slaves of drink and thralls of sleep? Was not that nobly done? I and wisely too. So a person listening in might hear that and think, oh, yeah, he's he's justifying what Macbeth did. He's saying it's understandable. In fact, it was wise and noble. But actually, again, if you sort of check the tone here, there is a suggestion that he's being sarcastic. Look, for example, at the use of rhetorical questions, exclamations. You've got these exclamatives here. And the fact that he's asking it in question form form I think is really important now remember what I was saying about finding your devices so if you were just struggling to find something to say here you could look for example at um, emotive language so picking out adjectives like monstrous you could pick out questions for structure um, here you've got a little bit of personification it would have angered any heart alive but if you couldn't figure out that that was personification you might have said metaphor, that would be fine as well, because personification is a type of metaphor. But you could again talk about emotive language here. So there are all sorts of ways of still getting that language analysis or structural analysis without needing to know all of the terminology. But this section here, it's about his tone. It's about the fact that he seems to be saying that he believes and trusts in Macbeth, but actually underlying that, you recognise, no, it's all sarcastic. He thinks the absolute opposite. OK, so actually, in this little bit, it's now the Lord speaking rather than Lennox. So Lennox has been quite careful with his words. The Lord, totally unambiguous. He calls Macbeth a tyrant straight out. Now, like I said, we don't know who this random lord is. So perhaps he doesn't have the same stakes that Lennox does. So he feels he can be a little bit more open. I don't know. Maybe he's just not as careful as Lennox. But yeah, he is unambiguous in his description of Macbeth here, calling him the tyrant. Now, if you were commenting on Macbeth's rule, you wouldn't have to just focus on what was being said about Macbeth, because you can actually look at the device of juxtaposition here, because the Lord, in order to demonstrate how bad Macbeth is, he uses a lot of really positive language to describe the attributes of the other, ta of the other side. So, for example, the son of Duncan, so this is Malcolm, he is living in the English court and is received of the most pious Edward. Now, Edward is the King of England. OK, so most pious, we've got the superlative adjective. So it, that's the EST form of an adjective or putting the word most in front of an adjective. So the highest degree. So the, the most pious. There is no one more pious than Edward. And pious means sort of um, religious and like a religious goodness. There's no one more kind of de devout in their faith. 
uh, he refers to his grace and here he refers um, to the fact that Macduff has gone to pray the holy king, Edward again. Now note the adjective holy, okay? So he's pointing out that Edward is God's rightful choice for England, okay? So there, there's no... Um, there's no corruption of the divine right of kings like there has been in uh, Scotland. And again, he also makes reference to God again here, saying that because Macduff has gone to wake Northumberland and warlike Seward, so again, getting more forces on their side, that by the help of these, and note the parenthesis, with help of uh, with him above to ratify the work. So he's saying that here, God is actually going to be on their side, that God will be on England's side. Uh, he will ratify, he will be there for them, he will support them um, because they are rightful. Okay, um, and he says that once this has happened, once God has ratified the work or gone to their aid or supported them, they will again give to our tables meat. So he's talking about life in Scotland here, once Macbeth is gone, we will again give to our tables meat, sleep to our nights, free from our feasts and banquets, bloody knives, do faithful homage and receive free honours, all which we pine for now. So again, we've got listing, largely asyndetic listing, so not very many ands, but here it's, he's basically talking about all of the things that they've lost. They've lost food, so that they're all starving. None of them are sleeping. So it's not just Macbeth um, who has had uh, sleep murdered. He's murdered sleep for everyone. Um, and then when he says, free from our feasts and banquets, bloody knives, this is because, this is metaphorical, but it's vaguely literal as well, because he's saying that they no longer feel that they can trust the people around their dinner table. Um, and note the way that we've got this plosive alliteration here, banquets, bloody uh, knives, so quite harsh, powerful, violent sounding words. So he's saying that you can't even trust the people that are sat around your dining table with you anymore. Um, and he, they are pining for this. OK, that's they are they are they are desperate to have that sense of peace back in their lives once more. Um, so this is the final section of the scene and our extract from all extents and purposes. Um, this is said by Lennox, some holy angel fly to the court of England and unfold his message ere he come that a swift blessing may soon return to this our suffering country under a hand accursed. So there's so much going on here. We've talked quite broadly about the meaning, but this is a real opportunity for language analysis. So I'm going to give you some critical terms on the slide to help you out. OK, so first of all, we've got our religious imagery. He's calling upon a holy angel. OK, um, so we've got religious imagery. Technically, it's metaphor as well, because he is meaning a person. He's meaning a person in that is like a holy angel um, fly to the court of, of England. So he's using imperative language. So fly, go, rush, flee, go to the uh, court of England and unfold his message before he comes. So he's basically saying he wants someone on side with Macduff uh, to, to help speed up the process. Obviously, it's metaphorical as well, um, flying to the court. It means with haste. It doesn't literally mean, you know, with wings. Um, but again, that metaphor is demonstrated here again, a swift blessing may soon return to this because he's referring to Malcolm and Edward and Macduff and Seward as the blessing. So he is being metaphorical there. A swift blessing may soon return to this, our suffering country. So personifying uh, Scotland, he's referring to Scotland here as the suffering country, like it's a person under a hand accursed. Um, and obviously we've got an exclamative, you can note the exclamation mark here, um, showing that kind of real sense of passion he has in what he's saying. The under a hand accursed, he's referring to Macbeth's hand. Macbeth's hand is accursed and they are held under it. So there's that real sense of oppression, but oppression from someone who was cursed in themselves. It's quite a perfect way of describing um, the situation. So it's a hard scene that I hope I've helped you unpick it. But just that last little bit, there's a lot of devices there. So hopefully that's the kind of stuff that you would be able to pick out. But like I said, if you were struggling to pick that stuff out, then you hit emotive language, you hit punctuation, um, 
and you try just focusing on those connotations. And the last thoughts for this little session, uh, big themes, little scene. So obviously this scene is all about rule, leadership and power. Um, and there's this kind of real juxtaposition between the tyranny of Macbeth, so the fact that he is a dictator, he is the tyrant, as the Lord makes reference to him, so his cruel, violent rule leading through fear versus true kingship. So the likes of King Edward and Malcolm as he will be holy um, in their nature because they are God's specific choice. So yeah, power, leadership, tyranny and kingship all to do with the different opposing forces. But this is also to do with conflict. So if you've got a scene on war or conflict, this is key because this is the development of the English opposition. And the fact that we learn that Macduff is moving forward to support them is a real catalyst for us. And it will be more so when we look at the next scene. Little narrative hook for you there. OK, I hope that was helpful for you. As always, just drop me any uh, questions or a line or two in the comments and I'll do my best to help you out or if there's anything that you would like me to uh, create videos on please just let me know. Do subscribe if you haven't already otherwise I will see you next time. Thank you so much for watching. Happy revising.